The uh, first of December, and the uh, time passes now very fast. 2018 is uh, slowly or quickly moving past already. And uh, just now, when I was uh, worshiping, uh -huh, I was just thinking that uh, for t today's sermon, I see a lot of you guys, and I, I see you know smiling faces, very happy, and all that. And I, and most of my my time with you guys is uh, very positive and joyful, all right? So I just want to say that. And, but as I was uh, worshipping God, I was also thinking that the, today's sermon is very important because uh, for all of you, you will all face uh, troubles in life. You will face, um, I mean, not all of you will face all the problems la, or troubles, but uh, you will face relationship problems with your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. You will face financial problems where you need things, maybe for emergency, to pay medical bills and so on, but you just don't have the money. You will face uh, troubles in terms of uh, health, whether it's your health or your loved one's health. You will face a lot of, uh, maybe people also say bad things about you. So you may face betrayal, you may face persecution, you may face uh, misunderstandings. And uh, what are you going to do at that time when you have no way to turn? Because for many of us, again, we are talking about if we face troubles, lah, at least in this church, um, if you know me, you know that you can find me. Lah, huh? And if you don't know me, you, i let you know now you can find me as well. Lah. <laughs> Um, I will try to help. And, um, and, and that's what I, I offer to you, but I'm, I'm only human. Uh, so. But I also want to say that the leaders over here in this youth ministry, they are also, uh, if you know them, you can look for them and they'll help you. If you don't know them, uh, I'll let you know now that uh, you can look for them. And uh, they will try and help you out. If they don't know how, They'll figure a way how. They have, done, they have done so. I'm not saying something that is a prediction. They have, they have shown, they have proven themselves uh, doing so. But when we are out of uh, Piazza Baptist Church youth and you're somewhere else, and now you don't have a church, and now you don't have a youth group, now you're not surrounded by people that are as friendly or as helpful or as caring as, as you would hope for, um, what do you do? And that's where today's sermon will be very important. Where we look into where you enter hostility when people are not necessarily uh, always thinking of uh, what is best for you. Huh? So I ask that you listen carefully because if anyone over here can say that there will be no troubles in your life for all your life, then I think you can walk out. Lah. But otherwise, everybody will face troubles in life. Now, we are going into this uh, sermon series where we're looking into three parts. This is uh, Abram's journey. So the last week, we looked into how he went from uh, what he was familiar with into what he did not know. So we're entering into the unknown. This week, we're looking into sojourning, into hostility. Now, I'll just say right here that uh, what sojourning is, is that it's a temporary stay. Sojourn is where you have it's saying that I just want to stay there for a little while. It's not saying that I'm going to stay into hostility. I'm going to be staying there temporarily in hostility. So that is uh, this week's. And next week, we're talking about how Abram continued in hope. All right. So not next week, next, next week, that we talk about continuing in hope. So this is the Bible passage for today. And uh, let's have a read. Now, there was a famine in the land. So famine is where you have no food. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman, beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say, you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram, 
and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues, okay, diseases, because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Genesis 12, verse 10 to 20. Come, let's pray. Huh? Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I was uh, recently reminded, oh God, that uh, someone came to me and said that doesn't really want to go to church because of the preacher. Um, and at that point, oh Lord, I, I ask, oh God, that you help me so that the people over here can hear truth from me, the preacher that they will, they will hear truth and uh, as, as difficult as it may be to take in that truth, I ask that you give grace and mercy upon this uh, young man and woman, that they will hear truth, even uncomfortable truth, but they are strong enough to take it. That they can hear it and they can ponder and not let um, their hearts be hardened against what you have to speak today. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, soften the hearts of the people here so that they can take in truth. They can take in life into their hearts, O oh God. And in the same way, O oh God, I ask that you help me speak truth. That while I, what I am about to speak, as many, O oh Lord, have been praying for me, will be words that come from you, and be words that transform, it be words that strengthen people, it be words, O oh God, that people can carry from their youth all the way to their death and beyond. That there's something they can as solid, O oh God, as the ground that we stand on. For Christ, your words are a solid rock. So Lord, help us, O oh God, to build a life on your words, O oh God. Lord, I commit this uh, session, this service, this preaching of the word of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There are going to be two readings of today's one. because Now, I want to just say, this, this, uh, um, this passage was a difficult one for me. Partly because I was trying to read it the first way. So I'll go with it with you one time, moralistic. We talk about the morals, uh, good, evil, should, shouldn't. Okay, that's how we, many of us read the Bible. We see that, hmm, Abraham shouldn't do that. Hmm, Pharaoh shouldn't do this. And we, we analyze, that's how we read the Bible, to learn what moral, moral education, Benedictine moral. So we're trying to learn some moral things. And uh, it's not always wrong, okay? No, nor am I saying it's wrong today. But what I'm saying is that it's one way of reading the Bible. So before we go to that, let's look at where this place is, all right? So there was a famine in the land. Now, remember from last week that uh, Abram came from Haran, ta -ta 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 from a place that he was familiar with, from a people, from a land, from a family that he knew, and he traveled ta -ta 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 to a place where he was a stranger by himself and his wife and Lot, and with a people that he did not know. And then today, we are looking into where he walked. Uh, he moved from, uh, from this place because there was a famine. There was no food. There was no food in this area. And then uh, he moved over to Memphis in Egypt. Now, the reason why Egypt tends to have more food, if you look at the Bible, is because it has the river now. So that river actually produces lots, allows more stable food. Whereas this one, they are very dependent on rain. No rain, no food. All right? Whereas this one is dependent on river. So that is the difference between the two. So uh, Abram went to Egypt to sojourn. So he went there as an alien, as a, as a, as a temporary resident. So some may say Abram should have stayed, not fleeing to Egypt, because God called him to Canaan. And by running to Egypt, uh, he was not uh, showing trust in God. So that's how some people would, would read this. Then there's another group of people, because I was reading 10 commentaries, and then they're all saying different things. And then, um, which is okay, because we are all trying to explore and understand. Some people are saying that Abram was showing faith in God. How? 
because he did not run back to Haran. But instead, he continued to, to go, intending to stay in that area, but he just went to Egypt temporarily. So when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, I know that you're a woman beautiful in appearance. Now at this point, Sarai is uh, 65 years old. And some of you may be thinking, um, how can a woman still be beautiful in appearance at 65 years old? Well, you can. In the first place, uh, beauty is very different in, is, is in different forms. So the current culture today is where beauty is always when you are young and you are of a particular body type. But that's not true in, uh, in the ages. If you look at the centuries of uh, people, well, paintings, if you want, uh, you can see that beauty has, is different from everybody. If you look at culturally, uh, again, beauty is interpreted differently from India, from China, from uh, Malaysia, from US, UK, and so on. So, and then when you talk about age, as a person ages, right, there is beauty. There is beauty in, in age where a person can be very graceful, can be very elegant, can be very... So there is beauty of some form in Sarai, all right, which is very attractive. And uh, we say that Egyptians should not kill men for their wives, but that is the fear that uh, Abram had. And over here we say Abram should not lie. He should protect Sarai instead of risking her for his sake. Because he's saying that uh, they will kill me, but if you say that you're my sister, they will not kill me because uh, they, they want to take you. But you say that I'm your brother so that uh, I will be safe. Then you can say that, wow, this is Abram, not a very good husband, isn't it? Uh, I mean, the husband is supposed to be the one, kill me first before you take my wife. But this one is like, uh, uh, don't tell anybody that I'm married to you. All right, so there is that, that thing happening over here. And not only that, I mean, uh, Pharaoh then take her, and then uh, Abram became rich, and uh, Sarai is now in Pharaoh's house. So he seemed to get a very good deal uh, out of uh, the whole thing, um, which is, doesn't look very well. But let me just try to, try to put it in terms that maybe you can understand. Or oh, at least I'm trying to, lah. Huh? The, when we read about Abra, Abram, and then we see this situation, it's very easy for us to say, "This is Abram, not a good husband." But let us put it this way, lah, huh? so that you can understand his situation. Can, let's imagine there's a couple. If you want to put yourself into that image, can also. But but let's say, for example, there's a couple, a boy and a girl. Okay, so there's a boy and a girl, or a man and a woman. If you if, uh, um. A young man and a young woman, okay? So what happens is that they are at the beach and then it's a very dark, it's night, okay? So it's around you looking at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock at night. And what happened, why they are at the beach was because somehow or another they, they got lost and then they, they, they somehow took a wrong turn and now they're at the beach. And uh, there's not much light anywhere and it can be very, very scary. But it's okay because there's nobody else around. Now, what happens then is that as they're walking down the beach, they see a group of men coming toward them. Not only that, then they find that there's a similar group of men coming from behind them. And the men don't look like they are, they are good people. So, in that situation, right, again, uh, you have a young man, you have a young woman, and you have a bunch of, uh, uh, you have what you would consider as a potential threat. Uh, maybe gangsters. And then, again, can, uh, do I need to emphasize, you are a young man and young woman, an attractive woman. And you have a group of potential gangsters coming in. Can you sense the fear for the couple? It is a very, very scary situation. Now, what do you do? You can say that maybe you can try to run, but for this case, it's very difficult to run. I mean, you are not, not as, uh, as young uh, or able to run. So what they did was, uh, if we want to guess, now, this is what some people guess. What Abram did with his wife was actually try a delay tactic. Meaning that if uh, people come and they, they want to uh, get this uh, Sarai, the, the reasoning here, this is a guess. I want to emphasize this is a guess uh, based on uh, Laban's case, but this is just a guess, a guess. So in order to get Sarai, if she is available, they will kill the husband. 
But if Sarai and Abraham are siblings, Abraham has changed from a threat to a negotiator. Because then now you will be able to talk to Abraham and say that I would like to have uh, this woman. And then what is the price? What is a dowry? La? So that's how, how, what do I need to do in order to have her? So then Abram is now no longer a threat. If we look into, I'm not, I'm not too sure whether I should share in this way, but I think most of you guys are older. So I don't think, um, and I think you guys, even from young, you are, you are already exposed to a lot of uh, more disturbing thoughts. But if we come back to that beach again with the young man and young woman, and you're surrounded by people, now the, key, the, the thing here is that you could actually lie. Because what you could actually say is that as these uh, gangsters come in and they say that, hey, this is, uh, you're, you're, in our, you're in our beach. This is our place. You need to pay the toll. Uh, okay, how much is the toll? I'm sorry, we were lost, but I mean, how much do we need to pay? You don't have the money, my friend. Uh, but your girlfriend over there is very pretty. Uh. Can we just borrow her for a while? Now, in this case, uh, what are you going to do? Now, you could lie, and maybe this is Abram's lie. Abram basically lied. This is not my girlfriend. I'm the pimp. If you want to use her services, I'll tell you what. Uh, I negotiate with you. But first, um, darling, can you just go into the car? So just make your way into the car. Let's pretend that the car is somewhere there. While I negotiate with the people. People can. Businessmen. They can negotiate, so they are willing to do so. So then, uh, after negotiate ready, then uh, Abram can then say to the gangsters, maybe then say that okay, uh, negotiation good. So I go over there and then I I let her know that uh, to be ready lah, huh? and then jump into the car, then drive off. That could be what Abram was trying to do, because if in that very hostile situation, where people are very quick to kill. You may want to just buy time. I am not saying then, therefore, that he should lie, because that's part of the problem that we have with this verse. Should Abram have just put trust in God and just told the truth and putting his trust that God will protect him regardless of what happens? Maybe, maybe we could say that. But what Abram did was he lied and he told Sarai to lie because to save a life. And I would think that maybe Sarai is willing to go ahead with this lie because it's again, you must remember, I would like you to uh, remember this. Abram, when he was in Canaan, he did not try to sell Sarai. Abram, when he was in Canaan, there is no sign, and in fact, when she died, Abram seemed to be very sad. So the relationship between Sarah and Abram, from my, from my reading of scripture, doesn't show any, any tension between husband and wife. The only reason why they would do this is because they fear for their life. All right? And so therefore, the wife is trying to preserve the husband's life. So that's one reading. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Because uh, what happens is um, you have Pharaoh and you cannot negotiate with Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh is so high up, after Pharaoh, there's nobody else already. So if Pharaoh wants the, the wife, Pharaoh compensates you and gives you everything that you asked for, which is all this, which is a better deal than you can get anywhere else. So, in fact, in most cultures, you should be very thankful that the Pharaoh or the king wants to take your relative. Because now you can then say that my brother-in-law is Pharaoh, which is far more influential for you. So Abram is now placed, in a, from a worldly point of view, in a very positive situation. But he lost his wife. All right. And we also say that the Lord afflicted Pharaoh. <laughs> then we say that God should not punish him punish innocent Pharaoh because Pharaoh did not know she was married. The, can you see that? Because Pharaoh says that I did not know. She, you, you, you told her that she was not married and now God punished Pharaoh by giving great plagues, great disease. How is God fair? And 
we asked this question just now. Why was Abram scared? Why didn't Abram just tell Pharaoh? Why didn't Pharaoh punish Abram for a lie? Is ignorance an excuse for sin? I mean, we have all these questions. And then we have Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him and they sent him away with his wife and they did not confiscate. You cheat me already. I should take back what is mine, right? But instead, you cheat me and then I let you go and you take everything that you cheated me out of. All the oxen, sheep, male, male servants, male, female servants. So God should have punished Abram, not reward him. Abram lied and raised Sarai. And then some people argue that God actually did punish Abram. The wealth that he received caused a division between Abram and Lot. That's next week. Next, next week. The maidservant Hagar, which uh, Abram got, caused great grief for Abram and Sarai later on. So did, did God punish Abram or not? Because if we want to say that God is just, we want to say God is fair, that God rewards the good and God punishes the evil, what is God doing with Abram? It seems that Abram's behavior is acceptable. So you can lie. Mm? But God is a God of truth. Which means that if you are to be holy like God is holy, you, God doesn't like liars. Scripture is very clear on this. So how then can we, as we read these things, can we understand what is going on here? Are we saying that we can lie when certain situations, when there is life or death situations, therefore God allows us to lie? Is that what we are saying today? Is that the lesson we are drawing from this passage? That in that situation, not only does God permit, but God will even reward you for the lie. Uh, then we, we are going over the place. So this is the passage. And then you see, uh, we, I have over here, Abram should have, Egyptians should not, Abram should not, God should not, God should have. So there's a lot of should have, should not, and so on. This is one way of reading the Bible. And then we, we do this, okay? We read about David, read about Noah, read about all these things. And, and we try to understand what are we supposed to learn from Scripture. The problem we have over here is, one, we don't know Abram's thoughts and reasons. Why did he do what he did? The other one is that we also don't know God's thoughts and reasons. There is no passage, there's no sentence that says that God uh, was displeased, God was angry, at God was... There was nothing to explain what was the thinking process of God, what was the thinking process of Abram. That is why people... I read 10 commentaries, 10 people say different, different things. Because they don't really know what's happening. So a lot of times it is guessing. Now we can try to look at the, we are, we are trying to look for help here. Huh? So let's look for help. Abram actually did this tactic two times. Two times. First time was with Pharaoh. Second time was with another king in another place called Abimelech. He did the same thing. He said that, Sarai, my wife, when people ask, who am I? You tell them that I am your brother. So he did this a second time. So let's have a read. From, from, from there, okay, from some place, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, Abimelech had not approached. This one means they had not had sex. Now, Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. He's saying that he is innocent. So previously, we said that God should not punish innocent Pharaoh because Pharaoh did not know she was married. So in this case, it's the same, same thing, right? Abimelech is saying that, you, will you kill an innocent person like me? I did not do anything wrong. Now God answers. Then God said to Abimelech in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So here God knows when you are innocent. God knows when you are not. And God 
the punishment or the warning accordingly. Maybe if Pharaoh got a dream, Pharaoh would dismiss it. But when you have illness, you have plagues, uh, then maybe he pay attention. But God uses the correct way to get your attention in his own wisdom. All right? So God is, doesn't do too much. God did not kill Pharaoh. God did not kill Abimelech. God told him that what you did was wrong. Even when he did not know what he did was wrong. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? So it's wrong to actually uh, sleep with another man's wife. You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did this thing? So now, first part we're asking, What did God think? Second one is, What did Abraham think? Okay? What did you see, Abraham, that you did this uh, thing, this lie, this deception? Abraham said, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. So the explanation over here is that I don't think you people are God-fearing. So I think that you will kill me. So in, in, that is the, the fear. So, so Abraham really did think they would kill him. And Abram didn't actually lie. <laughs> didn't actually lie. Even though we would say that uh, it is uh, half truth. All right? Because Sarai was actually his sister, but uh, not through his mother. All right? So then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell wherever it pleases you. To Sarah, he said, Behold, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Ah, yo, Abraham, very lucky boy. Huh? Because everywhere he go, he get money. I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you. And before everyone, you are vindicated. So Abimelech says that I did not do you any harm. Everything is clear between us. I don't owe you. You don't owe me. 1,000 go. All right? So that is what Abimelech is saying. Then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech and also healed his wife and female servants so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So we can get an idea. Huh? We know a bit of God's thought. God actually knows whether a person is innocent or not. And we should not, can I just say, we should not try to be God and say that God, you should have punished him less, you should have punished him more. Because God is the one that knows what is in the minds and hearts of the people. The other one is, uh, Abram's thoughts, well, he actually thought he was going to die. And I think when people do that, you, you will do far, far worse than what uh, Abraham did, all right? Which is lie. So this is what we have so far. Uh, it's another should have or should not that, that is missing over here. What happens is that the famine should not have happened. Why was there a famine? Why is there no food? Have you considered that? Why is it that the creation, that the world uh, did not offer food? God created the world. God created this land. But why is it that people were going hungry? And then let's look at redemptive history. Okay, Yeesh, history, sejarah, I hate that. No, this is talking about redemptive history is another way of looking at the Bible, which may be very, very important for, for you, where we don't look at the Bible and try to learn moral. The way we read the Bible in redemptive history is we see what does it tell me about what Jesus did, about what the Bible says about creation, about sin, about, about uh, Jesus, and so on. So what does this passage tell me about Jesus? And we can see, first of all, that the world has fallen. The world is corrupted. The world is broken. The world, instead of providing you food, apple from the tree, uh, pears, uh, grapes, and so on, where man is able to enjoy God's creation, now what happens is that no apple, no grapes, you are now hungry because the, the ground is not giving you food. There is no rain. It is creation has broken already because of what uh, Adam did in the garden. In response to a fallen creation, another way of reading this passage, huh? this passage we read, Abram, in response to fallen creation, now looks for a place, a safer place to go. 
And because of uh, sin in, in people, you have murder, rape, theft, slander, hate. So you have all these things happening in every way. People are doing all these type of things. And what Abraham was doing was he was responding to a society where people were killing, raping, stealing, and he was trying to protect himself in a fallen world. Okay, that is what he was trying to do. He was trying to protect himself from a fallen world where there is a famine, there is no food. He's trying to protect himself from a fallen humanity where people are evil, where people are doing evil things. And God's justice falls on Pharaoh despite ignorance of sin. Despite Pharaoh saying, I didn't know it was wrong, but God's justice still falls on him. And God's blessing still covers Abraham despite Abraham committing sin by lying. Hey, this is a very different way of reading what we just read. This is a different way of reading the passage. Okay? So, God's justice falls even if I don't know whether it was a sin. God's blessing comes even when I sin. Hey? So, we go and read further. How, what does this mean? So you have fallen creation. Now this thing, famine, I want, of course I want to zoom in for famine just for a moment. Famine occurs in the scripture. So this is talking about fallen. Huh? So as, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, this is Matthew 24, the disciples came to him privately and saying, tell us when will these things be? The, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? This is talking about judgment. This is talking about the time when, when there will be a final judgment. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Will Christians go through famines and earthquakes? Yes, they will. And this is a different book, okay? This is from a different book. This is from Revelation. Uh, it's a very scary book. I normally don't try to read this. But, um, but this, there's this thing about famine there as well. When uh, he opened, okay, the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. Now this part a lot, maybe you're not clear, but the main thing I just want you to, to capture. Lah. And uh, I look and behold a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. This authority is given by God. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Again, this talks about Christians. When he opened the six, we got fourth, fifth and six. There are seven all together. And I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. So there will be an earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth and the full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and, up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? The point here I'm trying to make is that the Bible talks about famine. The Bible talks about earthquake. The Bible talks about there will be a lot of death for Christians. Alright? So there will be a time of trouble. So, in that time of trouble, you may try to look for a safer place, but you will also fail. Do you understand this or not? Now, this is a very important thing. Maybe not for us, lah, huh? because now if you're hungry, you go away, you go sugar bun. You can go buy, call me, three bucks, you can get. There is no famine. But the reason why the church needs to preach on this is because there will come a time, either this generation or my children's generation or the children's children's children, if the church forgets this lesson over here, the, the believers, the people who trust in God will not know that this is supposed to happen. Alright? So this message needs to be 
uh, read and told. Fallen humanity. Do you ever wonder why is it that uh, you get angry, get upset, get jealous, get envious, get all these type of things? Two things. One is the people around you. One is you yourself got a problem. There is sin in the world. And that is because of fallen humanity. What Abram did was try to protect himself from fallen humanity so that his life doesn't, doesn't get lost. And, and then you can say, okay, you can say, Ayo, Terrence, that was then, that time. These things don't happen today. People today are not like the Egyptians that time, Ayo, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Today, if this type of thing, if Abram really feels scared, he go to a police station. We've got judges, governments to stop, or if they cannot stop, they'll punish. Okay? This type of thing that we're talking about just don't happen. Now, we were talking about a walk in the beach, right? Just go down a beach, just enjoying yourself. Now, if there was such a beautiful beach, okay, this is a photo of an island somewhere, and there's a beach. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to just be able to go on a holiday, Christmas. I mean, some people go on a holiday, they go to the beach and enjoy a walk. Now, if I was to tell you that by walking on that beach, you trespass and then you are immediately executed and killed. Is that too much? It's too much, right? Just for trespassing. It's not your property. I, I walk, 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 then I walk into Marriott beachside. Then Marriott, uh, God, go and shoot me down. Because trespass, wrong side of the beach. It's too much, right? What should happen is the Marriott guard come and tell me, excuse me, you're not supposed to be here. If I resist, they catch me, and then they go and throw me on the other side. All right? But then that is what should happen in a civilized society and a civilized world. Do you know this guy? John Allen Chow, 26 years old. Missionary. He was killed, I think, uh, two, three weeks back. His only crime, because I think if you guys are reading newspapers or reading uh, Facebook and you talk about uh, all this Christian stuff, uh, the world is very angry at this guy because he went to a place, to an island, where people said that you're not supposed to go and then, and the only reason why he wanted to go there was to tell them about Jesus loves you, God loves you. So the world thinks that John Allen is crazy. Okay? Can. I can accept that. Christians are crazy. Can. But when he is killed for trying to go on the beach and he got killed, what does the world say? Do they say that it is not right because what they should do is catch him and throw him out, which is what you would do in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Brunei, in India, in China. They first catch you, then they deport you. This guy, he comes onto the beach. People don't want him on the beach. They kill him. And will the parents take his body home? Today, the police in India, the people, the governments are saying that he deserves his fate because he break the law. But when a drug addict goes to Singapore and is caught, people don't execute the drug addict immediately. Oh. People bring the drug addict to trial, bring for sentencing, send to jail, and then they execute. That is what we call a civilized society where the law is put above men. But how come the world says it is right for him to die the way he did? And people laugh, people ridicule, and you say that our world is just, civilized, right. Even if he did wrong. I want to put this, because some of you guys may, may not be Christians. I understand that. For a Christian, it's very easy. His death is a tragedy, but still God will make use of his life. Still. And my preaching over here is my attempt to honour his life. Okay? But if you're not a Christian, consider, lah, huh? 
The crime he did was to step on a beach. That is his crime. Does that crime mean death? And if not, why does the world say that this one was right? It is not right. It is very unjust. But if you read the news, people, many people, Twitter, all these things, they think that he deserved what he got. How can that be? Even if he is a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Hindu, stepping on a beach does not bring a death penalty. So if you say that people today are not like that, you say that ah, these people are like those people lah, during Abraham's time. Yeah, I agree. People like this, and I'm not saying this as in that I condemn them, I hate them or whatever it is. Because John Allen Chow said one thing, do not hate them even if they kill me. So Christians are not called to hate. I'm not saying that these people are hateful, but what I am saying is that these people, they kill without second thought. And that is the sort of thinking that Abram had to face. And if you say that these people are uncivilized, not like you and me, then why is it that the world does not condemn it? That shows that we are also not civilized. And even better, lah, huh? I can tell you, that if you say we are very civilized, rape still occurs. A bus in India, you can have all the men rape a woman. And there is no justice. In parts of Pakistan as well, if a woman is uh, raped, and then she tries to bring the man, the rapist, to court, the person who gets jailed and killed is who? The man or the woman? The woman. So why is it that people say that now we are living in a world of Facebook, of Google, of uh, laws, but yet all these things are happening. People have not changed, you know. You may think that people have changed, but the same type of mentality that Abram had to, he had to face 4,000 years ago uh, is the same sort of thing that we are still living today. Today, if I've said this before, but I'll say it again. You take away the policemen, you take away the judges, you take away the army uh, from Malaysia, from Sarawak, from Miri, uh, you will see how civilized the people in Miri are. Take away the policemen. People will not be civilized. Uh. That's why we thank God for authority over us. So even though sometimes young people, you like to make fun of the police and judges and corruption and all that, but also bear in mind, huh? I'm probably going a bit off topic. Uncle Franco last time stopped a rapist. Did you know that? Somewhere in Lutong, suddenly there was a woman going to scream. Ah! And then Uncle Franco was in his house. And then it was a, he was said it was a scream out of huge fear. He tried to listen, cannot find, but he thinks he knows where the house comes from. So he goes and run over there. Then he bang, 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 bang the fencing. And then he didn't hear, but he still suspects there's something going on. You can ask Uncle Franco about this. Then he goes and call the police. Because uh, you're an ordinary citizen, I mean, I don't think any of us dare to enter a house. Because you don't know whether there got 10, 20 people inside there with a parang or not. So we go and call the, the police. The police came. They entered the house. They, there was a young woman and then an uh, uh, oil and gas uh, employee. And then there was the rapist, a young, young fellow with a knife. I think a teenager with a knife. Then the police go and take the man and uh, get him out. Uh. Thank God for police. All right. So don't be too quick. Huh? Authority is, again, something that you need, we all need to respect. So what happens is that the world that we have, huh, we are all still the same barbaric, wicked sinner. You know? And we just now read this passage. Jesus was saying all this thing, Matthew 24, verse 3 to 8. Now, you, you, we talk about... Um, the people and how, as Christians, uh, how, how we relate to, to fallen humanity. Fallen humanity. The next verse, okay, the next verse is uh, verse 9. Verse 9 to 14. Jesus says, Then these people, okay, they will, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And many will fall away and betray one another, hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So a lot of things at the end there, but I'm not talking about that. 
The key over here is that you will be hated. Christian, you are hated. Do you know that or not? They say, huh? Hated? I'm not hated. Nobody hates me. Everybody loves me. I'm popular in school. People love me and so on. No, 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 no. I'm telling you right now that Christians, you are hated. See this one. UC Berkeley. This is an American university. Huh? There is a campus senator. Campus senator is like a, if you have student council, I think in the schools you have student council, universities with student council, so you are like student representative of the education uh, institute. Abstains from a vote. Now students want her out. Okay, what is this talking about? Now, I want to point out, this is not a Christian newspaper. San Francisco Chronicle is a left uh, newspaper, so meaning that it is not very, it's not Christian. I purposely go and choose this one. I didn't choose a Christian paper because I want to show you that this is what is being reported. Okay, I'm trying to be as unbiased as I can, even though that's very hard sometimes. So this one is actually from a, uh, not a Christian newspaper, not a Christian news source. And this was taken on November 9, 2018. Today is 1st December. So this happened very recently. What are we talking about here? Okay, so I'm just going to read the story. A student senator at UC Berkeley abstained from a vote supporting transgender rights last week and then took a moment to explain her thinking. Now more than 1,000 people have signed a petition demanding that she resign from student government or face a recall. Hundreds packed a Senate meeting Wednesday night to insist that she go. On social media, students labelled her a horrible person and a mental imbecile. Not because they know her, because they disagree with her. Her campus political party severed ties with her and the Daily Californian, the newspaper, ran an editorial critical of her statements and refused to publish her written defense. So she tried to explain, but people don't want to listen. Reading a five-paragraph statement explaining her decision, what was her decision? Remember, people were saying that transgender should have this, 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 this. She said that I disagree, so she abstained. She didn't vote for it. So Chow um, told her 18 fellow senators who all voted for the bill that discrimination is never, ever okay. This is... Never ever okay. Okay, she condemned bullies and bigots. She said she abhorred, she hated stereotypes, and she called the LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual community, valid and love. Sounds good. Sounds good. That said, Chow continued voting for the bill would compromise her values and force her to promote groups and identities she disagreed with. As a Christian, I personally do believe that certain acts and lifestyles conflict with what is good, right, and true. I believe that God created male and female at the beginning of time and designed sex for marriage between one man and one woman. For me to love another person does not mean that I silently concur, agree, say yes, not, when at the bottom of my heart, I do not believe that your choices are right or the best for you as an individual. Meaning, when I see a young man, a young woman, not yet married, go into a hotel room planning to have sex, I cannot say that that looks like a good idea because they love each other. Because I believe that it is wrong. Now, you may still choose to do so, but you cannot tell me and force me to say it is correct. I can disagree, even though you choose to still continue. Huh? That is what this woman is saying. And I picked this story because she's a very young woman. 20 years old, I think. She's a university student. All right? She could have merely abstained, but she took it upon herself to go into this long dialogue talking about marriage between a man and a woman and shouting hate. So they hear love. They hear she, her say, she say love. They think of hate. Nobody asked her to explain her vote. Nobody who voted yes had to explain their vote. Within hours, cut ties. Uh, everybody cut ties. Uh, call her statements offensive. Uh, students cannot allow, the students in the university cannot allow and accept leaders like Chow to make decisions on their behalf. So they condemn, 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 condemn. They say that uh, what she wrote was homophobic and transphobic. So they refuse to publish. Now, last part. So last part. Uh, Chow said she's been surprised by the onslaught. I go to classes, people are looking at me. I've been painted in such a negative light. Everybody's talking about it. No matter how much I try to say I can love you and still disagree with you, people still interpret my disagreement with being a bigot and a hater. So I disagree with you, but I disagree with you means that I hate you. How is that? I am a Christian. I'm que queer, which is uh, lesbian. And I'm good, right, and true. A student named Miranda said, and I demand Senator Chow to resign. And the child says, no, I'm not planning to resign because if I do, there will be no one else to represent the voices that are ignored and misunderstood on campus. Are you able to do such a thing? 
Are you able to stand up in your workplace, to stand up in your school? And when people say that, I mean, why, are, why, why you want to deny these people rights? Or why, why is it that you have this type of thinking, which is from the Bible, which is old? Why do you have such thinking? Are you able to stand up and say why you believe what you believe? I don't think many of us can. But I pray that most of us will. Alright? So when you say that I'm not hated, it's actually not true. See, I say so twice. I, it's not true. Mm. The reason why you don't feel hate, let me explain to you. Huh? Because you haven't talked to the right person that will hate you, and maybe because you haven't talked about your faith. In certain places in the world, you can step out and say that I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Four words, and people immediately hate you without knowing who you are, what you do, why you are who you are. Because they hate Jesus. All Christians face hostility, whether you know it or not. And Peter says, we are sojourners. I don't want to read we are sojourners, so it is all temporary. And he says over here, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of judgment. So even if we are sojourners, the, the key over here is that we are temporary in hostility. I'm trying to convince you here that creation is against you. I'm trying to convince you over here that humanity is against you. But Peter says that even though all these things are against you, you are a sojourner. You are staying here temporarily. You still keep a good conduct so that people look at you and they will give praise to God. Alright? Doesn't matter what happens. So we have fallen and so we, we look to protect ourselves. So the way I read that scripture, right? We say, Abram, you should not be doing this. But I tell you, all of us do that. We try to protect ourselves. We try to make sure that we are not hurt. We try to make sure that our lives, our interests, our finances, our, our relationships are not hurt. And we also lie. The reason why we lie is because there is sin outside and there is sin inside. So Abram did not do something particularly unique. He's doing something that all of us here do. Because this is what we live in. We live in a fallen world. And God's justice falls on sinners. So even if you don't think you've sinned, this story says that it doesn't matter because God's justice will still fall on you. But here's the part that's interesting. God's blessing covers Abram despite him committing a sin. So why is Abram special? Why is Noah special? Why is David special? Why are all these th people special that when they sin, God still takes in? And here is the very big thing that I want to tell you. Your sins or wrongs do not matter. Eh? Terence, every week say that your sin is the thing that causes you to have a gap between you and God. But over here I'm saying that your sins or wrongs do not matter as much as your standing before God. You see, eh, it is not that Abram, Noah, David, you, me, Paul, Peter, we are all righteous. That's why we can uh, have the blessings and favour of God. We all have sin. But yet, God still chooses to bless us. Why? Because of our relationship to God. Not because we are better than other people, but because my standing with God, because I call God my Father, because I call Jesus my Saviour, my standing with God is more important than the sin that I commit. Understand? My standing, my position, my relationship with God is the far, far more important than any or the worst sins that I can commit. Because if your standing with God is right, He will allow you to repent and your sins are washed clean and not a drop will be remaining. So it is Christians who are different from, uh, from the slides. Uh, why are Christians special? So, Christians are special because... Hmm. Next. Side control. Christians are special. And we'll read the next one. Next. This is the one Uncle Yap preached on. On Sunday. This past Sunday service. Alright? But it's a good one. And I, when I listened to it, it was a really powerful one. So... 
We are asking the question next. Why are Christians special? All right, why are Christians special? We are asking this question, and the answer is over here. Next. Because Christians are special because according to his great mercy, he has caused us, God has caused us, God has caused Christians, God has caused Christians to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So many words. What it means is that we are special because God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. God has called us to be Christians. Next. And it is just as God guarded Abram. This is why I want to encourage you. You cannot, can you understand this or not? Abram can never get Sarai back. There was no way for Abram to ever get his wife back from the most powerful man in the world. He cannot. But what happened was God bring Sarai back to Abram. All right? And the same way that it is God's power that guards your faith. So you trust on God, not on your ability to hold, but on, your, on God. All right? So you put your trust on the person, God. Next. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while if necessary. You have been grieved by various trials. So just as Abraham had to flee from a famine, just as Abraham had to lie to would-be killers, just as Abraham had to fear ungodly rulers, you also have to do the same. Because when you work, sometimes you find that you cannot get any, you cannot find a job. And you have to go somewhere else. Your relationships may be broken, you have all sorts of things happening, but you have to go through these various trials. All these things are happening as well. Next. But when you go through those trials, it tests the genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold. And this genuineness of your faith is more precious than Abram's sheep, oxen, male donkeys, all these things. When you know that your faith in God is solid, that is far more precious than what Peter over here says, more precious than gold. And you will not exchange it for anything else to know that your faith in God is genuine. Next. And may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So your trials result in, your trials result in praise and glory and honor. Your trials, your troubles, the problems that you have in life, the failures that you have in life, the broken relationships you have in life, all the messes that you have made in your life, they will result in praise and glory and honor. When Jesus Christ shows. Next. Though you have not seen Christ, you love Christ. Though you do not now, now see Him, you believe in Christ. And rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is Uncle Yap's sermon. So it says about joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable. That is the passage. Next. And we talk about sojourn into hostility. The key word here is for a little while. Whatever troubles that you're facing right now, it will be for a little while. I guarantee you this. Terence, can you guarantee me this? I, I'm guaranteeing. I know what it means by guarantee. Huh? Some people don't understand what's guarantee. Okay? I, I can guarantee you this. Guarantee means that uh, whatever. I mean, you ask me for anything you want, I guarantee. That's what I understand as guarantee. Meaning that if I say guarantee, if it doesn't work right, you come to me uh, and you can ask for whatever you want. My house, my car, my money. Because I guarantee. Ma. This is not limited guarantee. Uh. This is guarantee. I guarantee that your suffering is only for a little while. How can I guarantee this? One, because scripture says so. Two, next. This is a, I'm closing soon already. This is a poem. Okay? A poem. I'm going to read to you a poem written by Hamilton, a Presbyterian missionary to China, as he reflected, as he think about the martyrdom. Martyrdom is the death. Okay? It's basically the same like John Allen Child. 
of one of his colleagues, J.W. Vincent, who had been taken captive by bandits, by gangsters, by evil people, and executed by them. Are you afraid? They asked as they threatened his life. No, he replied. If you should, I go straight to heaven. They did, and he did. Here is how his friend, Hamilton, commemorated, remembered the life and death of uh, this, his friend, Vincent. Next. The first three verses of the poem goes like this. Afraid? Of what? To feel the Spirit's glad release. To pass from pain to perfect peace. The strife and strain of life to cease. Afraid? Of that? Afraid? Of what? Afraid to see the Saviour's face, to hear His welcome and to trace the glory gleam from wounds of grace. Afraid? Of that? Afraid of what? A flash, a crash, a pierced heart. Brief darkness, light, O heaven's art. A wound of His, a counterpart. Afraid? Of that? Maybe the poem too chim for you. But there is nothing to be afraid. For John Allen Chow, even as he goes to his death, same case over here. Arrow, gun, whatever that happens, he goes straight to heaven. We have nothing to be sad. Christians, we have not much sorrow for John Allen Chow. Here's the, the, the irony of it all. We don't need to feel sorrow for him because he has gone. We feel sorrow for his parents. We feel sorrow for the for people he has left behind. We feel sorrow that he has more things that he could have done. We feel sorrow. We feel sorrow for the people who kill him because they have lost a chance, one chance, hopefully not the last, to know Christ. We feel sorrow for those who ridicule and laugh because by their words and by their actions, they condemn themselves before the Lord Jesus. Next. So, brothers and sisters, we live in a hostile world because the world is fallen and people have fallen. But I want you to put your faith and trust in God. Because no matter what happened, Abraham, God rescued Abraham and rescued Sarah, his wife, two times. God is always there for His people. And those who are wicked, God will punish them according to His own wise measure. We don't have to think about how come that person like that, like that, like that, but he still lived a good life. His judgment has not arrived because God is just. Alright? So we put our faith in God. So with that, I ask that everyone have some quiet time. I'll give you some space and time to pray. And I want you guys to to remember that whatever suffering that you may be going through today, lah, huh? it is only temporary. It is a soldier. You can tell yourself, I'm only going to be here for a little while. But while I'm here, I'll give praise and honour and glory to God. Huh? So give yourself a quiet time and I'll pray for you afterwards.